So at the beginning of November, um, England has this uh, celebration called uh, Guy Fawkes Night or Bonfire Night, which means that from around the second of November, I'd say, up until well, it's it's the ninth today, and it's still going on. There's nothing but fireworks at night, and I find it really weird that we celebrate this because we're essentially celebrating. Um, Guy Fawkes who tried to blow up the Houses of Parliament and failed. Now it's a celebration where uh, we set off fireworks to celebrate the fact that he failed. <laughs> but because of this, it means that my cat, specifically my cat, my youngest, uh, she's terrified. So I've been having to sit up with her most nights. And it means that I've been getting a, a fair amount of reading done in the last like two weeks. Which is kind of cool, it's like the only good side to um, Guy Fawkes Night. Because of lockdown, it's not like anyone can go to a bonfire festival either. So it's it's weird, it's just people letting off fireworks in their back garden at ridiculous hours. But like I said, it means that I've been able to read a fair bit in the last two weeks. And I do have to very much thank Matt Draper for convincing me to finally um, star Alan Moore's Swamp Thing. I don't know why it was taking me so long. I mean, I really like Alan Moore. But if you ever want to see, like, the craft of creating comics taken to its possibly greatest form, I would definitely suggest ta uh, taking a look at uh, Swamp Thing. Uh, the current collections, I think there's like six volumes. I'm on volume four. I'm just at the point where it crosses over with Crisis on Infinite Earths, which was the point I wanted to get to because the whole stuff with my research, I didn't want to spoil any of Swamp Thing for myself, so I decided to sit and read it before I got to that point in my research for Crisis. Because yeah, that's, that's fun, trying not to spoil things for yourself, but then still trying to get work done so you can get your bloody doctorate. But yes, Swamp Thing uh, is absolutely amazing and I never thought I would appreciate this character the same way I did before. To the point that I've even bought a couple, a couple of the, um, the Bronze Age collections for it because I thought, okay, I want to see where this character came from and I know it was created by Len Wein and Bernie Wrightson and Bernie Wrightson I have a huge amount of respect for. I absolutely adore his artwork. He did a lot of illustrations for Stephen King books, which I very much grew up with. Um, I've been very slowly reading The Stand, and every time I come across an illustration of his, it's just like, oh wow. <laughs> he also did like Cycle of the Werewolf for um, Stephen King, and he did the Creepshow comic, which I need to get. I think there's a copy in the house, but I can't find it. But with um, Alan Moore's Swamp Thing, I'm incredibly surprised because it starts off trying to wrap up um, the previous writer's story arcs which I have no knowledge of so I'm coming in and I'm reading this first issue and I'm not really sure what's going on. I get that it's a finale and like handing over the reins but then you get to the end of that issue and um, spoiler alert Swamp Thing is shot in the head but this begins Possibly one of the strongest things I've ever read called The Anatomy Lesson. And Mad Draper does a so he does so much better job than I do of explaining it. But there's so much tension in this issue about what you learn about Swamp Thing and how Swamp Thing learns about it as well. And it gets to the point where the whole rest of that first volume has this underlying melancholy to it. Because this is a man who's struggling with his identity. And he's now pretty much understanding that the goal he was building to, going back to his original body, is not going to happen. And you, you find this the more you go through the volumes. I mean, I sped through volumes two and three. And it's absolutely gorgeous stuff. I, there's some really disturbing moments, I must admit, especially in, um, like the end of volume one and volume two in uh, particular, 
there's just a lot there that was sort of like, oh my god, when I stop and stopped and thought about the implications. But as a researcher, I also found it very interesting of how um, the medium itself is used to tell the story. And I know I'm rambling on about Swamp Thing now, but it's just because I haven't finished it yet, so I'm sat there going, I just wanted to get everything out. <laughs> This is- you're literally listening to my mad ramblings, and I wish I had like a podcast or something just so I could talk about this stuff on a more regular basis. But there's- it made me think about the idea of narrative as transition, because there's this whole thing in comics where you have, um... Scott McCloud identified like six leaps of faith between panel transitions that your brain has to make. But then there's other people who've stated that there's more of them, and the more I think about it, the more I go, yes, there should be more transitions than this, because action is not limited by one thing. Never mind. But there's this way that Alan Moore writes the dialogue between scene changes that got me wondering that if the dialogue wasn't there, would it completely change the leap of faith terminology that it goes into? Would it go from scene to scene to non sequitur? And this is the kind of shit that keeps me up at night. <laughs> um, Part of me sort of wishes that I'd read Swamp Thing before, because then I probably would have started my doctorate with a lot more questions, and especially a lot more focused questions. Heck, I probably uh, might have even looked at Swamp Thing instead, but hey, I'm a, I'm a DC fangirl at heart, uh, so I love the fact that I'm looking at crisis events. And I love the fact that I'm sort of looking at this very specific point in history right now because i'm looking i'm starting my research by using the original crisis on infinite earth as like a testing ground for some of my ideas before i start going into zero hour and infinite crisis and final crisis but because i'm looking at this very specific era in dc right now so mid 80s and backwards i'm sort of seeing how we got to where we are now and that sounds really stupid. I've got like a Bronze Age, Silver Age, and Gold Age collections, and you can you can physically see a difference. But while reading Swamp Thing, and I'm I'm signaling Swamp Thing specifically because I've looked at some other stuff that came out in that era. But with Swamp Thing, it feels like this was the turning point for comics to be more modern, like comparing how they were focused, how they were set up, how they were written. This is sort of the turning point. And I'm very much looking forward to finishing um, all the books. Uh, I, I'll probably call up Matt and just have a, a large debate with him over it. <laughs> I already mentioned it to my doctoral supervisors that I've been reading uh, Alan Moore's Swamp Thing. And uh, the one who reads comics was like, oh cool, awesome. So I might even write a conference paper on it at some point. But then again, I also have other conference paper ideas, like the use of tarot cards and the supernatural uh, for DC. Just because I've been noticing that a lot. But anyway, the other thing I have been reading, which is a lot more recent and a lot more mainstream, I finally have all the volumes of Scott Snyder's Justice League run, which obviously runs into death metal. And being a crisis junkie, with my own words, to be honest. I'm really enjoying going through death metal. It's it's really weird um, waiting like month to month for more of the story for death metal, because I must admit, I mean, I usually trade white, but I was too excited for death metal, so I've been getting all the issues and all the tie-ins. I think the only ones I haven't been getting is literally the Justice League issues, which I'm still debating going back and grabbing. But now that I have all five volumes, I sort of- I, I did a quick flick through the last volume when it came through, as I usually do mostly, because um, it arrived through Amazon, and I've had some problems with Amazon lately where pages have been slightly damaged and I've had to send books back, or they've given me a refund just because the book is completely trashed. It's like, what the fuck? But I was flicking through it and I noticed um, stuff from DC 1 million was in there. And uh, DC 1 million is an omnibus I bought like a year ago, it may have been a bit longer. Because when I was trying to pin down what I wanted to do for my doctorate, I thought okay, I'm interested in time, so I want to look at stories that sort of play with time, and DC 1 million was like on my list. 
so I have the omnibus and it's really cool. So when I was flicking through and I saw like Cal Kent, I went, oh, what are you doing here? Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go through these and sort of read it. So I started back with volume one, um, actually last night, and Cal Kent's right there on the first page, and I'm sitting there going, oh. Okay, so Snyder has set stuff up as early as the first page to pay off much later. And, and granted, that's no surprise. This came out of um, Dark Knight's Metal and Justice League No Justice. And it's clearly leading into Death Metal. But it was little things like that. I, w I was really debating like putting a notebook next to me. And uh, for context, I have read the first volume before. This is just me rereading it. And I've also read volume four as well, <laughs> which might seem really weird, but it's um, it's when the sixth dimension stuff was coming out. I, I was really interested in that because I really love uh, Jacques Jimenez's artwork. And there was like this transition he did of like Superman punching with like the spirits of John Kent and Jonathan Kent behind him. So his uh, adopted father and his son. And uh, I'm a pretty big Dragon Ball Z fan and that reminded me of like um, the Kamehameha that Gohan uses to kill Sal where there's like the ghost of his father behind him which I think George Jimenez has even outright said that it's a reference to it which I absolutely love thank you George Jimenez for that so I did read um, most of the sixth dimension I read that story arc I know there was more in the fourth volume than that but I purposely stopped there because I knew I was going to go back and read the whole thing. So now I have volumes 1 to 5, plus uh, the hardcover for Justice League Aquaman Drowned Earth, because I know that comes in uh, like in the middle of volume 2, and I didn't think volume 2 would probably collect the whole thing, it would just collect the Justice League issues, which obviously makes sense. But I am really looking forward to sort of doing this read-up, and I, I keep saying to myself that I want to do a read-up to Death Metal so I can get the most out of Death Metal. And I've been doing, like, these charts to try and figure out what exactly I need to read. And the problem with Death Metal is just how much backstory you would need to read to sort of get the most out of it, even just going back to, like, Dark Knight's Metal. So, obviously you'd have to read Dark Knight's Metal, and then Justice League No Justice, and then Snyder's Justice League. But then you've also got uh, Doomsday Clock, which comes into it, then you've got Flash Forward, then you've got Heroes in Crisis. There's just a lot you have to read to go in, and then uh, I would hazard to say that even some of uh, Justice League Odyssey and Justice League Dark would come in as well, which I am also enjoying. I've um, been picking up those in trade as they've been coming out and i am especially loving justice league dark and surprisingly enjoying odyssey but it's really interesting trying to make this timeline of everything you need to know just to get the most out of death metal and the problem is that because death metal hasn't finished i can't fully make that diagram once I've probably read Death Metal all the way through, I can make a proper diagram, because obviously uh, there's multiverse stuff, uh, there was a tie-in which involved the people from Earth 2, which means you'd have to go back and read uh, the Earth 2 stuff from the New 52, and then to get the most out of that, you'd also have to read Future's End and Convergence. It's, it's really complicated. I think I posted the initial version of my diagram um, to a couple Facebook friends, and one of them turned around and went, oh god, that idea of like comics being easy to get into is just completely gone. So we were having a debate about, um, I think there's a quote Stan Lee said about, while every comic could be someone's first, that doesn't mean that every single one has to be written as though it is a first. Which I do think is important. I mean, um, there's uh, a saying that comics are basically, especially superhero comics, are a lot like soap operas. And there's this idea of like long-running storylines and the only way you're gonna get everything is if you sit and read nearly everything. And I sort of understand that, especially when you look at um, some of the stuff coming in through the tie-ins for Death Metal. Because there's a lot of multiverse stuff that goes back a long way, like Owlman makes an appearance which you could say 
would take you back to pre-Crisis on Infinite Earths, but then you could also say, oh no, that comes from the New 52 Forever Evil storyline. Like, it really depends on perception, and then you have, like, the vampire Batman from Red Rain, which was in the early 90s? It's about as old as me. And stuff like that, and then even, like, this quote-unquote steampunk Batman uh, from Gotham by Gaslight, which was 1989. It's, it's really interesting to try and track everything you need to focus on. And I, now I realise that I really am rambling. This is just what I think of when I'm reading these books and people wonder why it takes me so long to read some things. Because <laughs> I get sidetracked really easily while I'm reading and I start making notes. And in some ways it's absolutely horrible because it means I don't get much done. Uh, I haven't read it yet. But I did uh, pick up an omnibus for my birthday last month, which was Wonder Woman War of the Gods omnibus. And I think this looks really great. I'd asked um, Twitter, I had like six omnibuses I was debating. And I said to Twitter, look, um, here's the six, help me pick. <laughs> and overwhelmingly they said, um, Wonder Woman by George Perez. The problem, that, and I had actually put up the George Perez Wonder Woman Volume 1 omnibus and War of the Gods. The problem with picking up the main omnibus is that I already have some of it in trade paperback. And if I am paying for an omnibus, I try and pay for ones where I have as little of the original material as possible, so I'm getting more new stuff for my money. And there's a very rare occasions where I break that rule. Um, so for example, Batman and Robin by Tomasi and Gleason. I needed that on the bus. There was no way around it. I absolutely needed it. Even though I had a good amount of the trades and a fair amount of the single issues. Uh, another example is Super Sons. I had a lot of that in single issues. And I had debated getting the trades, but then as soon as they announced an omnibus, I went, nope, that's it, I'm getting that omnibus, that's mine. So I have a first edition of that, although I've seen that they've announced um, a second version, which has this interesting blue cover, which is okay, but I kind of like the original white. I know the only thing they've added for the expanded one is like the Adventures of the Super Sons, and I have those in single trades. So... You know, there's no major loss there. I have I have the omnibus I'm happy with and I have the traits for the stuff that's missing. I do, however, have my eye on Superman by Tomasi and Gleason. They're doing an omnibus of it and that just makes me so happy. <laughs> um, I think I've rambled on for quite a while. <laughs> uh, I do plan on like doing these more often just to talk about books. And it, it's it's kind of nice not to be on script every now and then. Um, I do have some ideas for scripts, some of which come out of my professional research, others of which are just stupid things I like talking about that need writing up. Uh, I would love to do some more stuff on Elseworlds and mythology, just because I think it's great. But yeah, what have you guys been reading? Let me know down below, and would you guys be interested in a video just talking about um, buying and maintaining omnibuses. Till next time.